speaking on this round table with Dejanay today. And first and foremost, want to set some ground rules. Um, you know, make sure that everyone's here is respected, difference of opinions, um, criticism should be received as long as it's done constructively in a way that we're really challenging what broken windows is or isn't, as opposed to personalizing this, um, or even playing into party politics. We want to make sure that this issue is something that is addressed um, to the core of the problem, as opposed to uh, many issues that uh, exist within differences of parties or whatever. So moving forward, I need to your name. You want to get up first, okay? Yeah, so just before we get on into that, we just want to discuss what broken windows is. Broken windows are um, policing policies that are for nonviolent, quote unquote, crime. So we just want to highlight that. Um, and the first focus today, we are going to then uh, have just for 15 minutes, public officials who are in the room. Um, this is your time to then share with us how have you um, or your office worked to end broken windows and how has those policies or practices actually worked to end broken windows? So those are your questions, 15 minutes. So we're gonna start off uh, with Council Member Gitaris. Okay. Let's put you on the spot like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, thank you, Senator. It's an honor to be here uh, with my colleagues, uh, Council Member Chaka, and Senator Reynoso, and Lonnie Williams. I think one of the signature initiatives of the City Council has been the push to close Rikers. And the mayor finally agreed to a process of closing Rikers. It's still a little too open-ended. Right. It's going to take too long. It's going to unfold over a 10-year period. But I think what's left unmentioned about the narrative around Rikers is that in order to close Rikers, we have to end broken windows policing. And broken windows policing is a driver of mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. Right, and we have no means of dramatically reducing the population of Rikers and replacing them with borough-based jails or cutting the population in half if we continue to have broken windows policing. I think our position is as long as you have broken windows policing, a mass incarceration will persist as a fact of life in New York City. Uh, and Councilmember Reynoso and I have been sponsors of the Right to Know Act because our belief is that you cannot improve police community relations without addressing the day-to-day -day interaction between the police and community. Right, the trouble with broken windows policing is that it means there are more encounters between police and civilians. And those encounters can have physical consequences that result in serious injury or death, as in the case of Eric Garner, where you had five officers wrestling into the ground for what? For selling the most Mickey Mouse crime, selling new cigarettes. But beyond physical consequences, also can have collateral consequences that limit your access to employment, Correct. to education, to financial assistance. And so you have an underclass of largely young men of color who have been rendered unemployable Correct. by their contact with the criminal justice system. And the numbers show that white people are just as likely to commit minor offenses and drug offenses <coughs> as people of color. In fact, I, I lived in public housing for most of my life. I went to NYU for a year. I saw far more drug dealing at NYU <laughs> right, right, than right. I ever saw. Exactly. But there's no broken windows policing at NYU. You're absolutely right. Right. There's broken windows policing in communities of color. Correct. Um, and I think it's a main. It's it's it's, like it's causing instability in our families, in our communities. I think it's a central driver of mass incarceration. So I feel like you cannot disconnect the narrative about closing Rikers from the broader narrative about um, curbing the excess of the broken. Um, really quick, um, so it's clear that you have a, an understanding of broken windows and, and the problem that it is. But so specifically, the question is, um, what has your office done to work on ending broken windows? separate and apart from broken windows. But I, I once heard a smart observation that, in some sense, stop and frisk policing is an extreme expression of broken windows policing. Because under stop and frisk, blackness itself becomes a broken window. Hmm. Hmm. Um, but we've seen a dramatic decline in stop and frisk. I think it's gone from 700,000 to 20,000. 
and that was largely due to a grassroots campaign that was led by people like Jamani Williams, an activist on the ground in the Community Safety Act and the court decision. Now, our, our mission is to pass the Right to Know Act, and we've been facing opposition from the mayor. And the Right to Know Act is aimed at improving the transparency and the constitutionality of day-to-day -day interactions between police and civilians. So it has two components. First is identification, right? If an officer stops you, he would be required to identify himself, explain the reason for the encounter, provide you with a card which would include the CCPR number and all his relevant information. <coughs> Second is consent to search. So back in the 1970s, the state legislature decriminalized the possession of marijuana, that you could possess small quantities of marijuana as long as you did not display it publicly. And you often have police circumvent the law by telling a young man of color, empty out your pockets. Correct. You empty it out, voila, you're displaying it publicly, you're under arrest. Correct. And you would have a criminal record that haunts you for the rest of your life. Correct. So under consent to search, the officer would have to inform you of your constitutional right to define a search that's not based on probable cause or based on a warrant arrest. <coughs> Almost like Miranda. Like you consent to the search so that you know that you have the legal right to define it. Thank you. Next, Councilman Antonio Reynoso. I'm going to try to take 30 seconds for the whole thing. Uh, Richie, Richie Torres, Councilman Richie Torres, is, uh, of course, uh, we share the Right to Know Act. Uh, Pushing, uh, I do the consent search is something that I'm pushing, um, and the ID bill is something, or we're pushing them together. Uh, so I definitely know that that's one of the most important parts of what I think would change police community relations on the ground level, right? Not coming top down, but down from the bottom up. Uh, but outside of that, uh, it's about speaking, speaking about broken windows and making it an agenda item or something that's a, a, a that's a, a focus in communities of color. Um, as of now, we have a mayor and a police commissioner that both believe broken windows is the best policy for policing in the city of New York. Um, I disagree with that. Uh, the mayor knows I disagree with it, the commissioner knows I disagree with it, and uh, outside of a change in leadership at that level, um, this is something that's gonna have to come from the people. It's gonna come from the communities, it's gonna have to be generated from, again, the ground up. A lot of the changes we've seen in the city of New York have come from work that have been done by advocates mostly and that we just are allowed to be um, a vehicle to, to assist in that change. Uh, but there is no law um, that I can think of right now outside of like the Right to Know Act that, that modifies uh, interactions, but not necessarily get rid of broken windows that we can push right now. So it really is about a change in, in mindset by the police commissioner and the mayor that this is not the way to go, that this is not working. And if the stuff that's happening regarding immigration is not a justifiable reason for us to re like, to look at how we're doing policing in the city of New York, it's gonna take a lot to change their mind. So I really think this is a policy issue, and this is, uh, uh, and that's hard. Outside of changing leadership, uh, it's gonna be something difficult to do. But again, our officers are committed to doing that. Uh, I will continue to tell the mayor any opportunity I get that broken windows is not the way to go. Uh, the commissioner knows that clearly, for Richie and I, are especially. So, um, and, and so I just keep preaching. Thank you, thank you. Our next uh, councilman calls for time. So I also want to say thank you for convening us. I think this is not only an important conversation for us to have as elected officials and organizations, but conversations that we need to have in our community. Um, you've already heard about the bills in the city council. Uh, I think uh, Councilmember Williams is going to talk a little bit about his right to record bill. So I really want to focus on two different things. One is connecting the dots. I think a lot of us in this room have had direct conversations about how we bring a lot of the different is issues right now in the budget. Uh, I'll bring up, for example, fair fares. A lot of you have been standing up uh, with the public defenders and organizations to make it a priority for this administration to fund uh, for low-income families that are jumping the turnstiles right now just to get to work. This is one of the top offenses that's being uh, targeted right now for our communities of color. Uh, and for me, this is an important thing to be able to bring back to the Broken Windows Policing and say this is, this is how we address it, by bringing resources to our low-income communities. Second, as a chair of the Immigration Committee, we've been incredibly forceful, not only in budget, but in policy, and how to bring more resources to our immigrant communities so that they can fight uh, more justly in our criminal justice system uh, and in the immigration courts. Uh, the senator mentioned deportation. Deportation is real, uh, and that happens in our immigration courts. Uh, these are federal courts, but the city has made it a commitment, and I want to say thank you to the state for making their commitment to making sure that we have resources for uh, for immigrants. This is not perfect yet, and this kind of concept of universal uh, universal representation is important to us, uh, and that's something that we're going to continue to fight. 
Uh, we want to hear examples and we want to hear about feedback and how we can make that better. We're in the middle of budget season right now. In fact, we are in the middle of a budget hearing right now uh, that we need to get back to, but this is some point, something that we need to get right here. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that in the community, we've had, we've had <coughs> new approaches. Uh, one of them has been, and, and uh, we've got we to talk about it, is the NCO program. These are the neighborhood coordination officers that this new administration, as we fight hard against the their kind of uh, resistance to broken windows as an issue, uh, they have come up with a new program. And this is an opportunity for us on the ground to understand it. Uh, in my district, there are two different precincts. Well, I, have, I represent four different precincts, but one of the precincts, the 7-2, has uh, almost for a year now been an active, uh, it's been an active program. Uh, Red Hook just announced it about a couple weeks ago. So we want to be able to get real, real time information about how it's working. These are officers that are trained in new ways and have never been, they've, they've never been implemented before. We, we want to make sure that we're hearing directly from the ground. Uh, one of those groups that we have been working uh, very closely with are our uh, vendors, our street vendors. And many of them in Sunset Park and across the city are immigrants. Uh, we want to make sure that we build relationships. Positive relationships are going to get us to a more productive uh, uh, police <coughs> community strategy. Uh, so those are the things that are important to me, uh, not only to my district, but really across the board, as you've heard. Uh, and I think we're going to round it off with, uh, with Councilmember Williams. But I'm really excited that this dialogue is happening, and I want to say thank you for everybody for being here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I know sometimes they highlight the differences, but I also want to say thank you for voting against the atrocious Blue Lives Matter bill. It's, it's horrific, and I'm sad that it passed the Senate, but hopefully um, it'll stop uh, at the Assembly. Uh, this is a great discussion. I've either uh, been uh, screamed at, protested at, uh, and or worked with a lot of people in this room, not necessarily in that water. Uh, so this is a, a, a great conversation. Uh, I, I want to take the opportunity to the things that I've said on broken windows that have been continually misconstrued, so I want to make sure uh, that I'm clear on, on what it is, and I stand by it. And so one is, I think, uh, my main issue with broken windows in theory is I feel like it's being misapplied. Uh, I have no problem. My mother is Caribbean. She said, you take care of the pennies, and dollars take care of themselves. So I understand that concept. My issue with broken windows is that it doesn't have to be addressed through policing, and doesn't have to be addressed with arrests and summonses. And so that's my main a problem with what uh, is going on with broken windows. And the second is, I have often said, and I still believe, some of the major focus uh, can sometimes be myopic, and I'll explain that. The same reason I thought some of the Stop Question of Chris focus was myopic. Because in my mind, it isn't Stop Question of Chris, and it isn't broken windows, it is policing. We've had bad policing in black and brown communities for far too long. We had it before Stop Question of Chris, and if we're not careful, we'll have it after broken windows. So I want to focus on the entirety of it because what it is is that there is over-policing in our community and we're not getting the additional resources that are needed. All we're doing is getting sent police and that is a problem. So some of those statements have been misconstrued time and time again and I want to be uh, clear on that. So I support all of the things that are being done uh, to deal with the issue of broken windows uh, as it is right now because it tremendously is a problem. Uh, my fear is that if we focus solely on it, Whatever comes after it, whatever that new name is, we're gonna be attacking that. And the real issue is this disparate policing that is going on uh, in our community. And some of the specifics, obviously, uh, the Community Safety Act supporting the uh, right to know, I have a right to record act, uh, which is uh, giving an affirmative permission for people uh, to uh, film the police. All of these are hoping will change uh, some of the interactions. But the biggest thing that I really try to do with, with some measure of success was really try to change what public safety means and for too long it has only meant police and I think we've done uh, some good work when it comes to gun violence in certain communities changing what public safety is and how we address um, gun violence that it's not just the police department has to do it all of the agencies has to be involved and um, we have we've come a long way but not far enough because we're here where we are now not because of Trump because of Democrats Republicans, people who are in power now who have been in and have fixed these things, we wouldn't have been as scared as we are right now. Our Trump is obviously going to make it worse, uh, but if we address issues within our broken windows, if we had done real criminal justice reform, we 
through city, state, and federal. It's not just Republicans, it's Democrats as well, it's us. People who have been, me included in the whole thing that we've been involved with, we could have done um, a lot more. And so hopefully some of the lessons is, uh, we can't think it's always gonna be uh, our friends in, in high office and hold people accountable. So I don't have people, I don't have trouble uh, people holding me accountable, but my hope is that we can really pay attention to the broader issue so we're not chasing these names every time there's an underlying problem uh, with police and uh, Thank you, Councilman Jelani. And, and I do agree with you as far as Trump didn't bring the majority of the problems in our communities uh, that's been uh, prolonged. And uh, when we leave here today, one thing I want to do is try to come up with an idea for legislation, uh, be it bail reform, uh, speedy trial, because a lot of times uh, our youth are arrested and for tri 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 trivial things, and they can't afford the bail. And they, have, they just languish in, in our jails until the court case comes up. And also with the DA's office, uh, as far as a lot of these new ADAs, instead of trying to find justice, just want to get a conviction. Uh, and so a lot of the judges are scared because if they let someone go and they commit a crime, they're afraid about getting reelected. Can I just make a recommendation? Yeah. Two, two will be great. One would be giving, just in general, the city council more power and oversight over the police department. And if not that, giving the council uh, power to have advice and consent over the commissioner. The only, only one person that we have advice and consent in is the DOI uh, commissioner. No other commissioner we have in having some of that um, ability on the police commissioner um, would help. TLC is used tactics. No, we'll look into that. Uh, and try to, I, I, I'm quite happy to bring it to the floor uh, or and bring a bill up in the, in the state senate and we can fight and see who our, our friends are and who are and who are not our friends. Yeah. And one, one more thing, if I can add, mm -hmm. you know, we can pass all the laws, but no law has teeth unless you impose consequences. Mm -hmm. And we're prohibited by state law from attaching consequences yeah. to whatever laws we pass. It's completely at the mercy of the police, of the commissioners. So that, that's something else worth exploring at the state level. And well. that's a good point because my first year in the state senate, they kept mentioning here in the North Country. And for a week, I was like, you know, why do you keep talking about Canada? <laughs> but it's a different mindset in upstate New York because their expensive police is much different from our expensive police. So it's something we have more dialogue about. Okay, so thanks for that. We're going to open up uh, now um, to different organizations that are in the, in the room in response to some of what um, the electeds in the room have said and their different offices. Um, so we're going to ask you the question, um, what have they said um, and in terms of your work uh, that may need change or may need a different focus or direction and then how has broken windows affected your work in life and we're here to create solutions to the to the problems not make statements as far as what can we do to leave it a day uh, with, with legislation that we can enact on a city and state level to change what's happening in our communities So I see Joe Smart then, Alex, right? Um, so it's good to be here for once and not getting thrown out of a, a council meeting. Um, <laughs> we've been thrown out of a few council meetings the last couple of years. We even had elected officials who told us uh, when we were protesting and bringing these issues up that broken windows didn't matter. And uh, the reason I say that is because this conversation is something that we've been having in the communities and we've been having among the activists and organizations for three years. Um, it wasn't just because of the Eric Garner incident, rest in peace, rest in power, Eric Garner, but it was also about the countless interactions we've seen in our communities for years without the media being there to report on them. Uh, there, was a, there was a gentleman in my neighborhood, a former, uh, a, former vet, a veteran, who was arrested by the 25th Precinct for the crime of sleeping in a public housing staircase. His name was Jerome Murdoch, and he was baked to death in Rikers Island because the police officers, instead of getting him help that he needed, they decided to arrest him for being too poor to have a place to live. And so when we talk about broken windows, we're inextricably talking about the issues of homelessness, around poverty, around just the, the people in this city that we don't want to matter. And so uh, the conversation is good. It's a long time coming. Broken windows has been around for over two decades. Uh, the return of Bill Bratton should have made it obvious to everyone in this room what was going to happen when the, with this mayor. So it's not just that the mayor is blocking a, a, you know, a set of, in my mind, moderate bills that are being proposed, but that the general po politics of New York City during the de Blasio administration was gonna be this. And he said, it, he said so as a candidate that he believed in broken windows. 
Um, in your packets, on the, on the bottom there is a people's agenda. Uh, it's a three pages stapled together. Uh, if I didn't make it clear, I'm with the Coalition and Broken Windows, which is uh, 10 grassroots organizations across the city, in the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, parts of the, the city where we're seeing these things happen. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've been meeting and having conversations with people, and these are some of the uh, uh, things that I think jumped out at us that we wanted to see happen. So when people were talking about uh, you know, how to take on broken windows, let's have this conversation. These, com these conversations have been happening, and it's important for people to acknowledge the organizations who've been doing the work and coming up with these solutions. In the agenda, which is a three-part, 22-point agenda, and it's evolving. We're having a town hall tomorrow in, in the barrio to add to uh, pieces of this uh, agenda. Um, there are very specific things that elected officials in this room can take on, whether you're a city elected official or whether you're on the state level. Uh, we have issues with the MTA. Fair beating is the number one broken windows arrest in the city. That's a state issue. Uh, we have issues with the city, with obviously the police officers. Uh, this, uh, the local effect officials here can handle that. Uh, one of the things you'll see at the very top of it is to reduce the NYPD headcount. Uh, unfortunately, the city council decided uh, fiscal year 2016 to add 1,300 police officers, almost 1,300 police officers, at a cost of, we estimate it's gonna end up being about $200 million a year that could have gone to a lot of the programs that we're recommending in this. And so for the city officials who are saying that they want to reform or end broken windows, we cannot have an end to broken windows when you're increasing the size of the police force in the city's most safest year on record. Uh, it's just uh, in, in, in inconsistent, schizophrenic almost, to be able to say you want to reform police, but you're gifting them more resources and more power. So if you take it from the top, you can read on through, so I won't get into it, uh, but there are solutions out there that we can start taking right away. And it's not stuff that only has to be done through the mayor's office. Obviously the mayor's an obstacle as well as the speaker in our opinion. Uh, but there's things that could be done on here and could be pressed on. And there's no, no stopping any elected official or any activist or any leader of organization here from using their public platform to immediately call for these things. Some of the things like the Fair Affairs campaign touch upon the issues of solutions that are non-police based. There are other non-police based solutions for all sorts of broken windows offenses. Broken windows is an ideology. It's not one policy, it's not even a, 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 a one set of policies. It's an ideology where we criminalize those who are most vulnerable. And from that, the police gets to uh, uh, kind of create policies and tricks and, and things that they're, they're gonna be able to do to carry through this, this politics, but it's a politics issue here. It's not just a policy reform issue, uh, and that's what the coalition uh, really wants to put forward, because the conversation to reform broken windows is incomplete. The conversation should be how to end broken windows once and for all. Reply to that a response to it. Uh, just uh, I, I think uh, your point just uh, right on. I just want um, just a little clarification because I see this on social media a lot and I post um, that talk about the hiring of officers in the city of New York. Um, unfortunately, that request uh, by the city council was put together as a, a piece of a larger, uh, broader picture of uh, a budget in the city council. Um, and. Uh, just like in the state and everywhere else, unfortunately, there are things in the budget that some people might disagree with, but the overall budget is something that you would support uh, and, and, and things like that get through. I want to be very clear that I publicly, before, during, and after um, the, higher, uh, the, the, the addition of the 1,200, 300 cops, um, I was against it across the board. I didn't think it was something we should have done. I don't think it addresses the, the real issues that we're talking about when it comes to um, services uh, for the mental for mental health and, and so forth. So uh, I just want to say I didn't in directly vote for the increase of cops. It was part of a larger package in the budget. And unfortunately, there's some things in there that you just don't support, but ultimately gets passed. So uh, it's not necessarily an excuse. It's just uh, looking at the bigger picture more so than uh, like an individual vote for the increase in, in cops. Uh, I think we found out about the headcount increase the day it was passed. The day it was passed. And yeah. it was, we were finished. I will just say that the headcount issue was something that was being raised for two years and it was being pushed by, yeah, by members of the Progressive Caucus. And so to say people didn't know or I was against it, if you were against it, you could have been very public out in front and said like, no, this is wrong and this is a waste of our resources. Because $200 million a year is gonna end up being billions by the time everything's said and done. And so for example, when we're saying we don't have money for fair fares and the mayor's saying we don't have money in the budget, fair fares, the, the full fair fare program could have been paid for by the exact price tag of the 1,300 police officers. So this was on, on every newspaper and in the media consistently for two years it was being pushed. Since Bratton uh, arrived again, the increase in the headcount was out in front in public. So every elected official had a chance to be very clear and more public to say, this is not a good use of our resources because ultimately budget is where we really see the values of our city. 
Fabricated evidence, lying, just to cover up to get the officer off. My thing with broken, broken windows is that instead of putting all of your investments in, into the police department, why don't you do something and try to invest into the community? Which is what I also have been bringing to, forward to a lot of the elected officials in my community. I'm in the downtown Bald Hill community. My son was murdered in 1994. <clears throat> And my thing has always been uplift the community. The community is the ones that need the help. That's who we should be actually looking at. I have also opened up a foundation in memory of my son, and I have been making many, many uh, efforts to the elected officials in my community, and it's just fell on deaf ears. They are not even trying, the community center in the Gowanus community has been closed to the youth for over 20 years. There is no safe haven for the, ch for the children, you know, to come to after, after school or, or whatever. I mean, how can you close a community center for the youth for over 20 years? How can you do that? And the only thing is left is the children to be in, this, in the streets and they have a target on their backs, every last one of them. So my thing with broken windows, we need to really try to invest in too many innocent lives in the <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Harry. So we have Alex and then Hawk. Hawk. Okay. And then Christian. I uh, appreciate uh, Councilmember Williams' efforts to have a little bit more clarity about what it is we're talking about. And I think we may want, and I've, I've been working on broken windows for 25 years now, here and in California and in other parts of the world. Um, I think we've gone a long way in disabusing people of the idea that there's a direct connection between arresting a homeless person in the subway and the reduction in homicides. That connection has, I think, in academic circles been largely blocked. And when uh, Councilmember Williams says uh, broken windows matters, it's a question of what tools we use. I would say we need to use a language that disorder matters. Because when we use the word broken windows, we're invoking, as Joe Smar said, an ideology that has clearly defined racist historical roots. Clearly defined. We know the lineage of academics who came up with these ideas who said, you know, poor people don't need services because they'll just abuse them. They're too lazy to take advantage. These are the words of the people who make up that tradition and we should just quit using it but we do need to take disorder seriously I wrote a book called City of Disorder I appreciate that politically as well as in terms of our quality of life disorder has to be managed it can't be ignored we can't have hollow appeals to tolerance while we invest in long-term solutions and wait for Trump not to be president anymore the question is what kind of tools are we going to use to do that and Police only have certain kinds of tools available, available to them. I appreciate the work that Susan Herman is doing to give them more tools, to diversify the tools, but I've asked the police department, show me examples of them using these non-coercive tools to solve community problems, and I've yet to get an answer. Maybe you all can get some stellar examples, but mostly we're talking about summons books and handcuffs and threats to move along things like that. Now, I spent some time in the UK in the fall on patrol in some big cities, tough cities. They use a neighborhood warden system there to basically address their disorder problems. They wear a windbreaker that says neighborhood warden. There are no 
no badges, no handcuffs, no guns. They go around and they work on the disorder problems. They talk to merchants about trash. They talk to people who are engaged in disorderly behavior. They make referrals to agencies. Now, of course, you've got to have the social services infrastructure to make referrals to. And we've got a lot of work to do on that front, whether it's mental health, housing, uh, trauma services for young people. Tremendous amount of work to be done on those fronts. But then we need people who can channel people into those services in non-coercive ways. Now, some people are talking about law enforcement assisted diversion. Again, you've got to have something to divert people into. But why armed, uniformed police making the decision about who should get access to limited social services and who shouldn't? Let's have civilian community workers. It costs less. They're more likely to come from the served community. And they don't come with any of the collateral consequences. They're not going to drive people into the criminal justice system. They're not going to accidentally shoot someone, et cetera. Um, so in terms of concrete things, that's something for the city council to think out. Uh, at the state level, you know, we need to do something about decriminalizing bear evasion. That remains one of the number one feeders into Rikers and, and into arrests. And of course, the police shouldn't be enforcing it the way they are. That's a local issue. Uh, we got to do something about the discipline transparency issue at the state level. That's a big problem. We don't know who's being disciplined half the time and what the real consequences of that are, whether or not that has any uh, positive feedback. We should look at what Seattle's doing with its civilian police commission. That was an outgrowth of the uh, consent decree there with the police. I'm hearing very positive things. I met with a member of that commission about two weeks ago who was here in New York. Uh, Lisa Dugard, who some of you may know, she was here in New York a couple of decades ago. I think we need to look very carefully at that. And finally, you know, we've got to continue to invest in alternatives. I appreciate Councilmember Menchaca yesterday saying it's not public transit if the public can't afford it. And that's where we're at. It's a whole swath of the population can't afford public <coughs> transit and then are criminalized when they try to access it. Public bathrooms, opening the parks at night with supervision so kids don't get arrested for being in the park after dark. Okay, let's open the parks up. Let's keep the lights on. Let's put some staff there so we know what the kids are up to. Those are the kinds of solutions. Thank you. I, I just want to say for uh, jumping the terms down, uh, we are introducing legislation in my bill uh, in the state senate uh, for making it a violation and not a misdemeanor. So we are working on that part. Thank you. Can I ask one? Yes. I feel like your point about the words that we critically important, but I feel like so many words have been co-opted in the service of, like, not only broken window, Bratton uses the word disorder. Yes. Order, maintenance, and policing. quality of life quality is of problematic. Life. So I agree. We have to, even the words that you're recommending are propagandistic and evoke racial undertones. And I think we have to think more deeply about the words we use. So I agree with you, but I have no recommendation. Yeah. Okay, so Hawk and then Christian. Hello everyone, I'm Hawk Newsom. I'm the president of Black Lives Matter Greater New York. Uh, thank you to the elect electeds who are here. Special thank you to the people who are out here doing this work for free that are fighting these fights for personal reasons or simply because they love their people. They love the um, community. Senator Hamilton uh, said something about us speaking to what we heard from our council members. The most disturbing thing that I've heard was that stop and frisk is over. It may be over to you, but to the people in the South Bronx, it's a reality every day. This is what we see. If you want to see broken windows at its core, go to Yankee Stadium. Go to Yankee Stadium and you see Yankee fans popping pills in the street. You see Yankee fans with open containers and what you see later that day or earlier that day depending on what time the game is the people who live in that community that pay taxes being harassed for the same thing that these guests of our community come in and do all willy-nilly so whether it's being reported or not that's something that we should ask and if it's not being reported then we should say hey uh 
what's what's happening why isn't it being recorded you ask for solutions okay i see instance after instance where police officers falsify reports and nothing happens you want teeth mr torres well where's the teeth in prosecuting cops who falsify government records where, where, when is that happening when is it going to happen that would scare people into falsifying these records that would help tear down that um that 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 blue wall uh what i'd like to see personally on a state level are special prosecutors on uh cases of police misconduct we have police officers who work hand in hand with the district attorney's office every day that was my first job out of college working for the prosecutor's office these people are buddies okay you go to the bronx right next to the courts there's a movie theater a plaza right the best thing ever happened in my neighborhood we were so excited the district attorneys call that place per plaza okay so my mother the grandmothers the kids going there are all viewed as perps by the people of new york the people who are put in place to defend them it it, it, it just it bothers me to no end and i feel like people don't take it seriously just this week a cop got away with killing a, a, a person in cold blood I, before I came here, I want to put this on your radar. Before I came here, I met with the mother of a man named Andrew Kurse. He was killed by the police last week in Schenectady, New York. He was chased. At the scene, he screamed out, you broke my leg. Police officers said that he screamed. Police officers said that he complained that he couldn't breathe and he was dizzy on the way to the precinct. By the time he arrived at the precinct, he was dead. Okay, the ambulance didn't arrive until 20 minutes later. Andrew Kurse, know that name, okay? His girlfriend, who was also arrested, witnessed the cops saying they needed a defibrillator in walking at a glacial pace to get a defibrillator. A man is dying. They don't care about us. It's us against them, okay? And until we deal with that, until we deal with the psychology of that, I think we're wasting our time. Police have to pay the price for killing us, for harming us, for abusing their power. Thank you. Okay, so we have Christian and then Jennifer. 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 Yeah, um, I wanted to respond, well, Councilmember Rain also has left. I wanted to respond to something he said. Uh, as far as you talked about that the, uh, the council does, can't set policy for the police and um, I just wanted to raise the issue that when they hired the, the 1,300 more officers, there was a deal that there was supposed to be a hard cap on overtime as part of the uh, salary. And they went over that hard cap by like $60 million. They, they had, there were no consequences for going over that hard cap. And that can be a policy decision. They could have said, look, we're not going to, or at least you can't just say, we can't give you the money that we already paid out, but you could say, FY 2017, we're not going to go over the hard cap and take that $60 million and put it in some other area that you know directly impacts the enforcement decisions that police officers or the police department makes. That is a policy decision that that can be done. I don't see why you, you, you can't completely divorce yourself from what the police department does. Yeah. All, a lot of these things are indeed policy decisions in terms of there's certain types of enforcement uh, that if you, that involve processing uh, arrestees, that if you take that money away, you say we're not going to enforce these areas of policing and put, you can take the money from in processing, uh, in uh, processing for police department, processing for corrections, processing going through uh, Rikers, processing in court, these are all costs and you can take those costs and put them in another area. You can just take the dollars from one area and say, okay, we're not going to do this area, do this type of policing anymore. That is a policy decision. Um, another issue I wanted to raise that he, he touched on, and, and you, you did too, uh, about the uh, Right to Know Act, and, um, and well, you mentioned the Right to Record Act also. Um, those, they're all worth, those are both worthwhile bills, but without, um, the ability to hold officers accountable for not doing that, it's, to me personally, it's a waste of time. I don't really see how it involves broken windows, but be that as it may, there's no mechanism to ensure accountability. 
it's a waste of time. They have they're supposed to follow the law. You you know you know that they're uh, supposed to allow people to, to photograph them, and they don't consistently don't do that. Arrest people, and there's no consequence for that. And if, if, there's, if there's no way to hold them accountable, then I don't see where we're, where we're going with that. So as far as uh, uh, oh well, the senator suggested having specific legislation. Um, I, excuse me if I'm not right about this, but it's my understanding that the, the present penalties for police officers for suspension or a maximum of 30 days is in the administrative code. Is that correct? No. Oh, I think somebody uh, might be, uh, might be uh, we, have, we have no control. No, that's not what he asked about. I don't know if it's, it could be an administrative code. It could be uh, some of the union negotiations. The council itself, though, what he's going to say is we have no control of that. And in fact, we can agree with you. The two areas that this administration has not improved in are accountability, and they've actually gone backwards when it comes to transparency. And so those are the two buckets that I think um, need the most work. So I agree with you. So we try to get these policies in place, uh, but without the accountability, it's tough. Well, that's, that's actually, I didn't mean to interrupt that, but you were saying that the, the, the other bill, Senator Hamilton, Senate Bill 2850, to amend Section 58 of the Civil Rights Law to make this transparent. I don't think there's anybody in the room that thinks that's a bad idea. So this is something that everybody is in favor of. And the question is how, how can we help you get it done? Can I, just one more thing. I wasn't gonna say, because I know it's gonna cause issue with the 1,300 cops, I wanna make sure it's also in perspective. And I should be held accountable for my vote. Everybody should be held accountable for their vote. Um, just to put it in context, uh, the council loosely made it a priority. Not everybody here made it a priority. They said it was going to be a thousand cops. It's actually the first time I've ever seen somebody negotiate and get more than what it was that they asked. But that's a, another story. Uh, at that point, my biggest thing is uh, there's different views. Uh, personally, there's 33,000 cops. I didn't think 1,000 less or 1,000 more was going to be make or break. And uh, while we have the largest police force, in the world, um, when it comes per capita, we're probably about six in terms of police per person. And so I tried to weigh all of those things together and I actually assumed we were going to get less. Um, and I said, look, this is supposed to be a progressive council. Uh, I want to see the same kind of investment somewhere else. And I picked youth jobs. And so uh, the, to what was supposed to happen in my mind, we were going to have equal amounts of spending. Uh, that didn't happen. That night we found out, so I'll never forget it, $170 million. I think at the end of the day, it's going to be more than $200 million. I was going to be counting overtime, and counting um, um, health care and all that. It, it was horrific. We did have the biggest amount of increase in youth jobs at that time, and a commitment that's actually been kept up until now. Hopefully, we kept this year to expand. Um, and that's why I voted. So I want to make sure I put that out. And you have to make a decision right there what's going to happen. And so while it is bad and we should have accountability, we be accountable for it. I want to make sure you put in context what's going through everybody's mind at that moment in time. I also did not want to vote down uh, more money for the gun violence work we were doing and vote down uh, the youth jobs. And I factored in that that 1,300 cops would still keep us about fifth or sixth in terms of police officer per capita uh, when you match all the other police uh, in, the, in the country. So I just wanted to say that. I, I, I don't think it's completely, I mean obviously we have no control over the system, but it's not completely a waste of time because litigation is a powerful thing. That when you have a law on the books, you can bring legal action against the NYPD, and it was a federal court decision that, you know, obviously stop and frisk is not over. But the courts, however imperfect, have been a far stronger driver of police reform than the political establishment. So I do think laws- it Doesn't have, have to be that way. Right. Oh, it doesn't have to be that way, I agree. So uh, we have a failed political establishment, I agree. That's, uh, the, legal no, no the, the legal route's one of the slowest routes. I agree. If we had a, if, if, if the system was working as it should, although one could argue it is working as it should, because of institutionalized racism, right? Okay, so we have this. Oh, to respond to Senator Hamilton's question, Senator Hamilton, 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 Senator Court, my anger for 25 years 
feedback and ideas, stuff that you can't put policy on the police department. Uh, it's not accurate. The city council has powers. We amended the city charter at one point to create what we hope was an all independent civilian flight review board. That's turned into a nightmare. You do have power. But more important than the larger issue, I agree with Ms. Marr, Mr. Haywood, and Alex, the premise of broken windows from the very beginning is false. The idea to go after the squeeze <coughs> guys because they're a criminal or disorder? No, they're a fucking employment job <laughs> applicant. That's what that was about. There were 76 squeegee guys in the whole city, and Ed Koch and then Giuliani created them as enemy number one. And where was the political people? If the political people said back then, or even now, we will not accept the premise of broken windows, it could change. Not only on conditions with regard to you give them money, you can set conditions on the money, but more important, with due respect, if you're thinking that you don't have the power to set the conditions for how an agency in the city of New York operates, we're back 40 I don't, I don't, years I don't, I don't ago. Saying. Well, you said that That's you don't have exactly. the policy. I said discipline. I didn't say we well, had no. Policy. I heard just in the little time that I was here. I thought it was you, if not, not you, me, no. other people talking about you don't have the power to create change with regard to policy. So, someone, what can we do to, to create change? I mean, what, what's your, your, your you recommendation? Need the political will. And it's not just the six or seven people that are here who are elected officials. You have to be the ambassadors to get to the other people in both the city council. And it's much harder in the state. But if we have a progressive caucus in the city council, if you're close to a majority, who knows what progressive means anymore? But in the context of that, I tell my joke, I used to think I was progressive. But if de Blasio and his folks are progressives, then I guess I ain't a progressive anymore. We're right on. So, <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that on the political dynamic, if there's a political will, as opposed to accommodating the law enforcement community, which I think is too much of the dynamic. When we created the Independent Civilian Complaint Review Board, I went to 136 community meetings in the course of a year and a half to make that happen. And a lot of people in the community, including elected officials, said, we're with you. But we're afraid because if we vote for something like that, we won't get the services and the cooperation of the police department. The response back then and today is, if I wasn't having taped, I'd use the F them, okay? The answer is, we don't have to accept those premises. So the answer to the question is, we've got to change the political culture over at City Hall, especially with the city council people, to bring about the change. And I don't want to be critical of you or the other people or the people that are here. You're the best we have. On the other hand, you shouldn't be winning by default. You need to be able to create the dynamic in the council to change that institutional mentality that we have to always be deferential to the police department. We always have to be deferential to the police commissioner. No, where I grew up, when you have a bully, you stand up to them, maybe you get hit in the face once, but they don't hit you ever again. And I think that's the biggest dynamic. And before you do that, I don't think the specifics are gonna make much sense because you don't have the political will and power to bring about the necessary change. And I think I think that's the dialogue. You know, that's why I think Councilman Menchaca, Jermaine Williams, and Richie Torres, because we invited most of the council people who are not here. So they're here uh, to listen, uh, to go back to their members, and I'm to go back to my members. So we just want to see and hear, you know, suggestions on solutions on how we change this. And, uh, and the more solutions I hear, I'll be willing to enact legislation to make a difference. So I'm going to go back to the stack, but I just want to say that means also not voting for a thousand more cops because of the ratio rationale of cops to people, but it means really calling into question the fundamentals of what Broken Windows Policing is and calling for the redirection of budget and into more programs or more things that will support and build community. I just want to say, I mentioned so, more things in the ratio. I just want to say that. But any rationale for more cops is not in e broken e windows. Easy to say, I got you. But what we need is, we can vote our own budget, but you know what happened the last time that happened to Giuliani? All of the advocates complained because they didn't get their money. 
And so if we wanted to do things, people are going to have to back up what they're saying. So, so there's, there's so, just... So one of the things we wanted to also talk about is hoping that there's a line drawn in the sand of advocates for our community. Because the, 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 the risks that we have now are even worse than we've had before. So Broken Windows Police and many of these offenses that are um, targeted to black and low-income communities, um, particularly for immigrants, are deportable offenses. So the 30,000 people who are arrested every year for fair beating can be deported for that offense. So when you can't pay that $2.75 and you jump the turnstile, you can be arrested and deported. And that was true in 2014. So when the collective, um, uh, when the decision was made to expand the police force and establish broken windows, the decision was to deport those people. And that was known. And that was what that was stated early on, and that was accepted um, across the board by um, um, the folks that, that, that are, that, that we're, 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 how we're discussing this right now. So the reality that we, we're dealing with now is that now, within this, in this new era that we're in, we're, we're dealing with a situation where people can be deported, not just, being for, not just being for convicted of a crime, but being charged with a crime, being arrested with a crime, and then efforts are being made to target people for even helping undocumented people being in this country. So it's much worse than we, we were in in 2014. So the demand is clear for us that th at the bare minimum, the bare minimum that we would require for people to stand for our community is to say that we gotta end broken windows and divest from policing and shrink the footprint of policing in the lives of black and low income communities and re reroute these resources into the things that make our community strong. That's just the bare minimum. That wouldn't be even something that is um, exemplary, it's just the bare minimum to start. Thank you. Okay, so Ken and then Tanya. Hi, I'm Ken. I'm sorry I'm late. Um, trains. Mm -hmm. um, but I also do work with Hawk um, from Black Lives Matter here in New York. And I think speaking about culture, you really have to ask yourself when you're talking about broken windows, does the city value black and brown people? And I think we can all sit up here in this table and see that by the policies that are implemented, they don't, right? And so when you're talking about political culture, the police are just enforcers of the political will of those who are in power. For example, one of your colleagues in the IDC, frankly, he just joined, but Peralta talks about cleaning up Roosevelt Avenue. What does that look like? Well, that's using the police to harass street vendors, to harass the youth that live in those communities. Right? And those are some instances that have been going on recently. When you're talking about the political will, the political will for black and brown people was only at the time when election season comes. So you're sending a message to the youth, specifically myself, that live in areas like Jamaica, that the only time that black and brown people matter is when we can get some political votes out of you. So when we're talking about broken windows, we don't really have to use academic language. I don't need to talk to the kids on my block or my friends about broken windows. We already know what happened. And even worse, we're talking about it from such a stand back position in which we don't even talk about how that harassment really takes place in such a violent and almost sometimes even like deadly manner. But when we're talking about broken windows and specifically policy situations that we can move forward with, we can unless we kind of had a, a call out culture, not just Democrat, Republican, or IDC, but the fact that this is the right thing to do. And too often we draw party lines along what's right. And so what the, we have, we're, when we're talking about broken windows, we're even up against the mayor or even the governor in terms of getting what's right for our communities. When we're talking about investing in our communities, that's complete obstacles to who's going to get a slice of that pie. And black and brown people are always the last to get the first slice, to get the slice of the pie, but always the first to be victimized and killed and incarcerated. And when we're talking about policy solutions for Jamaica specifically, we got to get rid of that police quota. You know, these things aren't necessarily hard conversations to have. I mean, we're here in the room. But these things aren't something that just pops up just now. I mean, this platform, granted, is great. We have ideas, they're great. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room has ideas. Talk with the people from these communities. We are just representations of these people that live in our communities, people who couldn't make it there. But we have ideas, but so far, the burden seems to be only on us to get rid of this problem, even though the burden directly sits with us and like targets us specifically. But yet, unless you're gonna have the city council members more so because you have city council members, specifically in Queens, that use racial language to target black and brown people, I'm not even gonna say names, but target black and brown people that you guys sit in the same room with. There needs to be a call out culture. Put it on the map, we already know, so that your colleagues know, so we know where they stand. Because now you have city council races, and even though the political culture is structured that not a lot of people wanna run, I'm not gonna go out there and vote. I'm not gonna vote for somebody in my community that doesn't want me to live in that community that calls me despicable or wants to basically ethnically cleans, cleanse areas that I wanna live in. Like these ideas seem so far and out of reach for some of us in this room, but we already have some of the solutions. 
we already have some of the ideas of how to make this work. When we're talking about resistance in the age of Trump, we've been doing it for 400 years. So I'm really confused as even just a young person who may be new to this game, I haven't been doing this for like 27 years, the fact that this conversation continues to go on without actually going to some direct solutions, it's because of the culture. Look at the CCRP, it's a whole bunch of appointments and basically handouts to police officers so that there's no clear accountability. And that's not even just here, it's in the whole state. And so I call on you to call out your colleague on the statements that he's made. We already hold our colleagues accountable for some of the crap that they What's say. You talking about Peralta? Mm -hmm. He made a statement saying what? He said that he wants to clean up Roosevelt back home. And so these are like racially coded language that's good for white people, I'm gonna be very blunt. It's good for white people, but definitely not good for black and brown people. And so, especially, if, and I'll give you a specific instance, you know, like me coming from Jamaica High School, if you don't have your student ID with you and you trying to use a turnstile, police harass you, you know, and they escalate that situation from there. So it's a whole culture within the police department that, for instance, there's gonna be no reform. You can put any policy on a police officer, they think they're the law of the land. That culture is because they're the enforcers of what they think is the law. You gotta change the law, but you first gotta change the culture. No, no, you're right, and the culture's been around for a long time. And you know, when I go to my weight trainer, I said, you know, I need to lose some weight. And he says, well, how long did it take you to get it on? You know, so it's gonna take time to make it happen. And what we're doing now in Brownsville, we have the campus, the first of its kind of public housing. Uh, we have uh, technology, uh, STEM, uh, coding. Uh, right now you can make $80,000 with a coding certificate or a high school diploma. We have wellness, psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers because um, suicide, the second cause of death, people of color, 15 to 35, anti-gang violence, um, and workshop development, workforce development rather than financial literacy. So it's taken off so well now that we have teachers and principals from other schools saying, getting coding to our schools. Um, you know, you show me a kid that has a good job, a good education, you won't see a kid in, in gangs. You know, you see a kid that's doing well. So we're trying to change that narrative in Brownsville. Uh, and the governor now has committed $1.4 billion up in central Brooklyn uh, to basically mimic what we're doing already. So I hear what you're saying, uh, and we're, we're, we're trying to change the narrative of what's happening. Uh, and that's why everybody's here, and I commend the city council, uh, Mayor Richie and uh, Mayor Chaka for being here, uh, to hear what you have to say. And uh, I think if you have solutions as far as proposing legislation, uh, all of it's not gonna go through. You know, uh, because the um, legislators of state uh, believe the police officers are the best thing in the world. That's just a, a matter, that's just a fact for them. So, but we, we do have dialogue, we're having more dialogue to get Raise the Age done. Uh, people are seeing that things are changing, things need to be changed, and I don't think that we can maintain the policy of incarcerating our young men at $100,000 a year. It makes no sense. Like, you know, we have million dollar blocks in Brownsville, you know, you know, and the quality of life is not changing. So I think um, we can do more on the front end by putting services uh, up front. And with the Big Ugly that we have up in Albany, they give us money for certain things, but there's something in the bill that you don't like, but on the other side, when you lose funding for your community-based organizations, so the bill this year was get $10 million for uh, immigration legal services. We got that, you know. We got to raise the age. So, you know, just by having this dialogue and coming up with solutions and legislation to make it happen, it's not going to happen overnight, you know. But we have to just keep, you know, fighting and keep building on what we have right now. So, um, legislation that's going to be introduced, hopefully it'll pass. So when you jump to turnstile, you don't get a misdemeanor, all right. You should have to go to Rikers Island. And the whole process costs two thousand dollars, but not paying two seventy five. Should have to go to court for jumping the turnstile. Should have to go to court, and we're going to try to reduce the fine because if you jump in the turnstile, your fine is one seventy five. You know, if you had the two seventy five, you know, you can't, you can't pay the two seventy five. How are you going to pay the one seventy five? And then when you do go back to court, now you're incarcerated for jumping the turnstile. So we're trying to change that, and we're working, you know, on low low hanging uh, of fruit issues, and I think we'll be able to get that passed also. Jackson Heights my whole life. I live on Roosevelt and Eaton First Street um, and I'm undocumented while well, I have DACA um, and I'm very sad to say um, but this is a story that um, I had to learn as a young woman that every time I, I call the police because of something that would happen the police never help me. I've never had an experience with an, with an officer that actually resulted in me being getting the services that I needed. Um, so I learned to never call them as well as calling, not calling them because of our immigration status. I was stopped by the cops for riding my bicycle on the sidewalk and that could have turned into a deportation order for me. Um, so, th and this is pre-2014. Mm -hmm. um, but you're, you know, Senator Hamilton, there's something called theft of services. Where do you go? <laughs> okay. Um, called theft of services that can actually be completely taken away. 
and that's a state level legislation um, that can change that code because that theft of services um, for someone who's charged with that and they want to one day adjust status to be a citizen or a green card holder, that can potentially be you're stealing from the government. So under Trump, that's even that's that's a, that's a criminal act. So I think at a state level, I think that's a that's a piece of um, code that you can change and eliminate completely. Actually, we'll talk about it work. yep. Um, another thing I want to talk about that's pretty prominent in our neighborhood are vendors, our street vendors. You know, unfortunately, we've. The last incident that was pretty horrible that happened in happened council member was um, uh, a older woman, Colombian woman, was uh, on April 30th was vending around Flushing Meadows Corona Park, and she um, was attacked by a parks enforcement agent. Right, not even the NYPD or undercover or sanitation. Sanitation now has ha they have handcuffs. Mm -hmm. Now parks enforcement has has handcuffs, and they attacked the woman, and she was screaming out, I, "I'm pregnant." and they held her down to the ground, and it took three people to hold her down. The community is afraid to go to the park now. Um, the community is, uh, these, are these are young women. They're trying to make a dollar, whether they're undocumented or not. They're trying to survive and feed their families. When, I, I'd like to ask you, because I, I have, unfortunately I see the vendors every day when I go home and I talk to them, when is the lift gonna happen? When is the vendor lift gonna happen? And I mean, we, we want these agents to be fired officially because people are afraid to go around them. They think that these, these individuals are gonna attack them. The community is afraid to go into the parks, like I said. So, um, you know, and, and this is not the first time it's happened. I know you've heard a million stories, like cops pouring bleach all over, you know, vendors' food. Um, so many, so many instances of this happening. So when, when are, these, these women are afraid to go to the police because the police is attacking them. Who can they go to to talk about these instances? Not the commission, because the commission is is not, I, I believe is not in their language. Um, they're afraid to go to the precinct to make any kind of complaint. Um, they, they've had to learn how to organize themselves and defend themselves and just run. But sometimes there are tickets that just arrive in the house because the officers know where they live already. Um, so, so I'd like to know what else besides the lift can be done, maybe putting a commission and seeing how these vendors can voice what is happening because they're very, very angry and they're very afraid. And also this, this is traumatizing for the entire community to watch them go through that, be humili humiliated in front of the entire community, have their food thrown in the street and treated like garbage and even said very disgusting words to them. Um, also, Senator Hamilton, there's some... Okay, he's not here. <laughs> well, okay, so for his staff, um, there's California passed a state, state sanctuary bill um, that is, I believe, you know, California is light years away from us in terms of bills that are progressive. Um, but that's something that can be pushed as a state sanctuary for immigrants as well, um, uh, for undocumented immigrants, making sure that the state doesn't collaborate with immigration. Unfortunately, uh, if you go outside of New York City, w I work at an organization called Unlocal, we're a legal organization. We tell our, our, our uh, clients to not step out of the five boroughs because it is dangerous if you go even in Yonkers and above. Um, so, so those are some of my recommendations um, that I can that I can talk to, and the last one is upon building upon what the last person said is uh, our senator, my senator Jose Peralta. He is brown like us, first Dominican senator to be you know elected or assembly member to be elected, but unfortunately he calls for an army on Roosevelt Avenue, and that is that is disgusting to us and it's offensive to us, and we need him to change his rhetoric. Um, he, he, he's, he's, this goes in line with the gentrification that's happening, um, and this is gonna completely wipe out the street vendors that are there, the small businesses that are on Roosevelt Avenue, um, because it's not only that, it's also state agencies that are coming to police our communities now. I believe the governor is sending more agents to come in and, and uh, give out more tickets. Um, at least that's what a lot of the Jornaleros or day laborers have been have been seeing on Roosevelt Avenue is that now now state troopers are are talking to them, not just NYPD, but state troopers. Um, so that's just some of the news from the ground that's happening now. So thank you for your time. So first of all, say thank you. Uh, so there's a parks department budget hearing right now that everybody's going to right now. So we're all in queue to ask questions. So I'm going to bring those questions about Hank. So I just wanted to get this right so I can make it be clear. Uh, this was an April 30 
Incident in Queens. Incident in Queens. What park? Flushing Meadows. This is Flushing Meadows. This is uh, a lot of street vendors. It's a huge, huge, huge. There's a video. Uh, and, and so it's very clear that you said that there was enforcement, uh, violent enforcement. Now, you said handcuffs were being used by the parks enforcement officer. No, they, they held her down. They held the, the, the daughter of the vendor down on the floor because she was trying to get away. Um, it took three officers to hold that one woman down. She just had given birth to a baby, and her, her little boy was right next to her and was trying to push the, the I can't even call him an officer, but the agent off, um, as well as her newborn was right there next to her. Um, and it didn't matter to them. Uh, they had to call for police backup, and they arrested her, and she's being charged with five counts now, and the charges are not being dropped. Um, all for what? For, for vending or trying to make a dollar? I know you understand what I'm talking about, but it's absolutely, it's not acceptable for them to treat women this way, yeah. um, to have three men hold a woman down who just gave birth. So I think we acknowledge this is not only wrong, but we're trying to figure out how to do a multi multi-pronged approach to the situation. We have a bill in the city council that's gaining support. Uh, the, the Street Vendor Project and all the allies are coming together all the time. We see them. They're actually bringing more and more people on, onto this bill. This is a very important bill for us. We want to get it passed this session. Uh, so thank you for this. This is an important thing to bring back to, to the city council. The vendor lift is an important part of it, but I think like what you said, this commission concept is an important part of this conversation so that people can be at the table that are going to be helping make these decisions on the, at the end of the day to help change culture. The culture piece is an important part, not just out of the NYPD, but anyone that enforces, uh, uh, anyone that is doing enforcement. So it's concerning that Parks is doing this. This is something that has, it's not the first time we've heard this in the city council, so I, I, we hear it. Um, I only want to bring one more thing uh, before, before I head out as well, that the uh, school safety agents is another issue that I think everybody understands. Uh, the theater of the oppressed has been doing a lot of conversations in communities, using the power of theater to bring incidents and to figure out how we change, change um, culture. One of the things that we want to do is actually figure out how to how to actually remove and transition school safety agents out of schools completely and bring another kind of back to your kind of new tools for, to figuring out how people can actually engage with. Uh, and I'm not the expert, but experts will insert what is needed to be able to figure out how to actually do discipline in schools and not result in arrests. We know that arrests are happening, they're, they're, they're skyrocketing in our schools and they're targeting our black, brown, and Muslim and LGBT kids. That's an important conversation to have. That's gonna take the will of all levels of government, not just the local state to be working in tandem. So I, I'm glad that we're, we're, we're talking beyond the NYPD. It's beyond the NYPD. This, this is really engaging everybody. Um, this is, we have to engage everybody. So I'm gonna bring this up in the, park, in the Parks Department uh, uh, budget hearing. Um, so a lot of the people that, vendors that I talk to are not part of the Street Vendor Project, so they wanna know how much t more time is it gonna take for that bill to happen? Because every day, it's like they're risking their lives, because you never know when an officer, their gun will go off next, you know? Uh, so every day they're risking their lives trying to, trying to sell. We're gonna take that, we're gonna take that. Carlos, so before you leave, um, there's something that, of course, we want to make sure we walk out of here today uh, hearing from our city officials and state officials, but he says you're, you're, you're about to break out. Um, we want to hear from you today. Uh, what concrete steps are you ready to take to uh, address this issue in the city council? What's so, next? So I think what, what we've, done, we've discussed a lot of ideas here. We have, we have some bills on, on, on the table that we're going to be pushing. Right to know, right to record, uh, the street vendors. We're going to look at, at legislation. Two, we're going to have to partner up with the state to figure out how we can work together to bring that crescendo. Right. Because I think you're right. The political will has to be demonstrated. It's not just enough to talk about it. We have to demonstrate that. So this is an important thing to figure out how we do that at a community by community level. Um, those are all things that we're going to we're going to talk about. But also connecting the dots to figure out how things like fair fares, as we're talking about low income families getting access to lifeline services, where when public transit isn't affordable to the public. It's not public transit, it's something else. And so these are these are things that we need to accomplish and we need to accomplish them in the middle of these budget hearings. This is something we've been pushing. It's been growing. It's, an, it's a political year as well. So for the mayor, it's an important thing for him to listen to us. But it'd be great to actually get the state uh, members to help us on this budget. I know it's a city council budget uh, decision, but it's an important thing that collectively as citizens of the city that you join us in that, in that help. So this is about unifying and creating one voice for the budget issues, for the legislative issues, uh, and 
and you, you just heard about all the different things that we're doing right now, while they are, um, they're not perfect, and, and, and I think we have to say that, they're not, they're not perfect, they're steps along the way, and those are the things that are gonna add, add a lot more pressure and cr critical mass to getting them right. So I just wanna say thank you for, on behalf of all the members. What about the city council calling for a summit? An all day summit, where all your colleagues are there, and other people can come and say to them what we're saying here and more, and try to then council figure members. out how you undo it. I like that, and again, this is where- Can we get a commitment from you here yeah, today? I'll, yeah, then I'll take it back, absolutely. We'll call for the summit for yeah. hearings? We'll call, yeah. we'll call for a summit on conversations about, about what we're talking about here to get more members. Conversations and action. Conversations and action. I think this is this is a start here. This is an important part of the conversation. You have a, I mean, you have a perfect example that you can take to that budget hearing and be like, look, this yep. happened. And that's what I'm gonna do right now. So I'm, I'm taking that and, and, and really kind of addressing that on a, on a bunch of levels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnson. Thank you. Okay, so we have a stack. Um, so Peyton, and then we have Kamala Millwood. Kamala. Kamala Millwood. Kamala Millwood, and then we have Christopher or Christopher Alexander. Yeah. Um. Very. Just very. Very quickly. I um, am the project manager for the police reform organizing project, and one of the things that we do is um, court monitoring. So we sit in on. Um, Manhattan, Bronx, um, Brooklyn criminal courts, and we see who gets arrested, what their race is, and what they got arrested for. And I cannot tell you the amount of people I see who get arrested for theft of services, which was a, which we there was like a logical solution to eliminating it that that was brought up that I feel like was a little bit passed behind because the senator had to step out. And I just wanted to reiterate that I think that that's an actual thing that can be worked on, that should be worked on, because kids have to miss school to go to court, and then if like like I met some kids who had like were there in the morning and then they had to like break and they still like weren't being weren't able to be seen so they had to like miss their entire day of school to go to court for this thing uh, because they got their their metro cards through their school and they were like jump the turnstiles to get their metro cards so all of this could have been avoided and i feel as though that was a really good point that was brought up that i just wanted to highlight um because you stepped out for a moment i wanted to make sure that you no, Ms. Barry, I, 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 I like, think I'll talk to me and we'll right. work on it, but like, let's actually work yeah, on it. Yeah, because well, I'm thinking about legislation that no child should be arrested of school age during school hours. And so that's something I'm looking at because it makes no sense if you have school hours, you know kids are going to school, so why are you arresting them? And, and you're not arresting them in all neighborhoods, only in certain neighborhoods they're being arrested. Uh, and people are getting aggressive. So that's, you know, so what I'm trying to say to you, Ms. Barry, if you have an idea mm -hmm. and I can introduce legislation, that's, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to listen. Uh, take your, your this, is your, this is what you're saying. Formulate legislation. I have my um, attorney here. Is Dan still here? Oh, he was he was here listening, and then we're gonna start taking uh, suggestions from you and start introducing legislation as we get back to all of you. So if you have any any legislation that you think we should introduce to stop kids from being arrested or going to school, jumping the turnstile, just let me know. Senator, just to answer Jeff for a second. Right. I would just like to say that, like, also we shouldn't limit that just to high school students. Right? Like it's like our like our kids do go to college, right? And it's like between that age of 18 to like 21, 22, like it's like they're not being provided assistance to go to school anymore. You know, like they don't have a school metro car to go to school. And it's like they're also in predicaments of being like criminalized, not even in predicaments, this is happening on a day-to-day -day basis, you know. People are like thefts of services is one of like the highest misdemeanors arraignment charges right now. Since 2015, I think it was like the second highest. Um, misdemeanor and assault and the third was like the highest which is also something that we need to just consider like we can't continue arresting our kids for these like minor situations and like instead of arresting them like let's have a drop-off center that it could go to or something that police are like quite honestly I'm just not a fan of the police in general like they haven't done anything productive to our in our communities um, but there are you know like they're established they're a huge power agency within our communities right now but it's like, they need to just stop arresting kids for these like really minor misdemeanors. Like take them to drop off centers. Um, and then like, for instance, there are- and What's also, a drop off center? Like sort of like, I would say like a drop off center, something like, I know they have it in LA in regards to homelessness. Um, so like, instead of like being taken to, to um, taken to like a precinct because of a, because of um, a sort of like a quality of like crime, quality of life crime, they will be taken to social services um, around the community that's really close to the community center. 
um, instead of being arrested. And these are things that we need to try to like just bring back into, not even bring back, bring into our communities now. And I think, yeah, like it was really alluded to like several times here, Josmar, Dr. Patel, um, Patali over there as well, study like we can't just rely on police officers arresting kids. Like we need to have other mechanisms and also us as brown and black folks that live in these communities, we can't be calling them all the time. Like we just can't rely on calling them. We need to have other mechanism of a dealing issues that's going on in our communities. So, so after the event, I have Dan here. Everybody, this is my attorney, uh, uh, Dan. And anybody who has an idea of legislation, young lady, right here. If you have any ideas of legislation, stay to the end. We're gonna have we're gonna go in the back and caucus, come up with some ideas. That's gonna be part of having solutions from leading here today having some solutions as far as legislation that we can introduce. Uh, but now I know the IDC, I can actually get legislation. I can't say we're gonna get everything passed, but we can have some legislation put on the table uh, to move forward to stop what's happening with our kids in the turnstiles. Yes, my name is Kamala Millwood, and I'm the Director of Communications for Black Lives Matter Greater New York. In addition, I'm also an Executive Board Member for Black Lives Caucus, which is a nonpartisan committee coming to be a catalyst for change in the community. I just want to tell you a story. This morning, I decided to take the train, and I noticed there was a girl. There's brown and black girls on a train in the morning. There was a brown girl this morning, around 14 or 15 years old, crying profusely. No one's paying any attention to her. She had a book bag on. It's obvious she's going to school. There are about four police officers at Utica Avenue this morning, and she was begging to go through the turnstile because she lost her pass. Adults were going through. No one's paying attention to her. The police officers were saying no, and she, transit people were not letting her through. This child is about 14 or 15 years old. What will happen if she were to jump the turnstile? I heard earlier the uh, thought of taking it from a misdemeanor to a violation was being considered. This is a child. Mm -hmm. We are a community. We take care of our own. I was so disgusted by how this was handled. I had an $80 Metro card. I said to her, sis, go through, and I gave it to her. I'm a mother. I'm a wife, and I'm responsible for my community. And I'm sick and tired of seeing us look the other way when it comes to taking care of our children. Enough is enough. We're not gonna have these meetings and sit around and do kumbaya and do nothing about it. The community is responsible for the community. We are supposed to be the catalyst of change. I'm sick and tired of these meetings that go nowhere. We need to implement something in which we take children into consideration. If you're in college, if you're in high school, if you're in junior high, you need to not be arrested. Go after the real criminals. We have a criminal now who is our president of the United States, and he's our president, and he's a criminal, okay? You know what he did with Russia, but he's still in office, okay? This girl is trying to get to school. In addition to being what I'm doing, I'm also a publisher, I'm also in charge of my own children's book company, I'm my own boss, okay? I take care of children, and I'm care I care for children very much. We need to stop having these meetings that don't go anywhere. He is here today. The, the legislation needs to be introduced. We need to come together under one umbrella and take care of our own. And this needs to happen today. If this is not happening, I will not attend any more of these meetings. Change has to come, and the catalyst of change is us. If we do not take care of our own, what will happen to the future generation to come? And that's all I have to say. To echo off of that. <coughs> Thank you for that. You're welcome. <coughs> Children that's uh, I'm in my community, downtown Baum Hill, Gowanus Houses, there are police that be stationed a block away from the school. And the children that's coming late, they ask them why they stop them. And I see this that went on a couple times. I said, why are you stopping them? They late, they trying to make it to school. They asking them for ID and they just writing their names and stuff and information. Making the children more late than what they are. You know, and I don't think that makes any kind of sense at all. So like you said, we need to do that. We need to organize our own community. Yes, we do. And there's a lack of sensitivity so in terms of, of the police. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, there's a and lack I mean, of sensitivity. It just falls on deaf ears. And nothing they're actually they're comes writing, out of it. Nothing they're happens. They're writing the students' names down on their papers. Is that what you're saying? Is that really the Hayward? Yes, they're writing their names down. And have you asked them why they're writing their names? They don't have no right to write their names down. They say yeah. that they just write it down just to, uh, what, what is it? One officer said, they just want to make sure that they going, they are going into school. Well, and we should talk to the specific commanding officer to stop well, that practice. I'll, fact, I'll, I'll talk. Norman, can't do that. Norman, in fact, That's just two weeks ago, there was a video that was turned over to us uh, in Red Hook. 
a young woman, uh, 18 years old. She was five minutes late to school. And the sergeant of the 76 precinct approached her, got out of the car, and it was 9.01, literally. That's the timestamp on the metadata of the video file. And this officer walks up to her and he says, where are you going? She's re literally 50 feet away from the school and he stops her and he's like, what are you, a boy or a girl? You know, she had her hat, you know, baseball cap, whatever it is, this is what this cop is saying. And she's like, this is ridiculous. She tried to walk away from her. He grabbed her, slammed her on the floor, body slammed this young girl. She weighs 105 pounds. And her other friend who was videotaping ran to the school to go get help from teachers. So this just happened two weeks ago. This is, this is luckily we have some video evidence of it, but she's facing charges right now. And this is Red Hook. And we know this is happening all across the city. I just want to introduce uh, State Senator Marisol Alcantara here. Thank you so much for the sponsor today. And if you want to say some words, please do so. Uh, thank you for having me here. I live in West Harlem, uh, right by City College. Um, I think that this is, you know, I always said that the practice of broken windows is not just broken windows. It's also a way to get uh, poor people to move out of the city because you harass people long enough that people end up out of the city. And I realized this during the last presidential election because I went to do door knocking in Reading, Pennsylvania. And if you, my age, you remember Reading was you used to go to the outlets to buy your school clothes to come back to the city. And when I go to Reading, I find out that the city of Reading is 76% Latino. <laughs> People that used to live in Washington Heights in the Bronx that cannot afford to live there anymore, they ended up there. And this policy of broken window of harassing immigrants and people of color is a way to beat us so much that we eventually get out of the city. Like I live by, my train stop is 137th and Broadway by, by City College. And you have a police van there every morning asking the kids where they're going to school. Some kids are like, what, what? It's because they don't speak English. You know, so well, what are you trying to do? You're trying to be smart in that kind of attitude. And I heard that before, what are you, a boy or a girl? You know, like that, they said that to a lot of our kids. So I think that the practice of broken window is not just incarcerating people of color, it's also getting poor people to move out of the city. You get harassed long enough right. that your parents don't want you to quote unquote get in trouble, so they send you down south or you move <laughs> somewhere out of the state of New York, your apartment becomes available for somebody else. So. Okay, so we have Chris and then Ken. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Chris Alexander from the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, definitely thank you, Senator Hamilton, for having us this evening and for allowing us to share uh, our experiences and, and the work that we do. Um, we are a national organization. We work all across the country, right? Our focus is on drug policies and the way that uh, drug policies are used to criminalize our community. Um, now, some states we work in uh, don't look like New York City, right? But when we talk about a reform in New York City, we have to talk about policing. And so I'm really pleased that a lot of the conversations around policing um, have, have been raised up today. Uh, but two things that we cannot forget, you know, as, as, uh, as we deal with trying to deal with accountability, um, is that front end stuff of changing the laws that are really problematic. Um, I work mostly on marijuana reform, right? Marijuana reform, obviously, a uh, form of broken windows policing. Also, formerly the number one misdemeanor arrest in New York um, the last couple of years. It's now dropped down a bit. Um, to the city council members who are present, and if their staff are still here, uh, there's a point of action that you know we would give to them is to one, uh, stop allowing the mayor to say that this problem is solved. This problem of, of the stop and frisk arrest, the marijuana possession in public view, as if that problem is solved, because it's not. There's, there's been no legislative change uh, that relates to marijuana policy in New York. Um, there's been policy shifts, and those policy shifts have not reflected real change because still, you know, we have a significant amount of people, 88% of them black or brown, getting arrested for this same offense when 50% of the country, 138 plus million people have admitted to smoking or using marijuana at some point in their life. But of course, in the city and elsewhere, the majority of people arrested look like us. Now, it's important for you know the groups in the room to recognize the connection here, right? Because while you know marijuana is a drug and there's all these uh, stigma issues related to its use, um, it's recognized that this is the, the, the perfect example of not just institutional racism, but of where broken windows policing um, really creates larger problems. Marijuana being used as a justification for police intervention 
for stops and searches, right? Those the searches occur, and then after marijuana is produced, it is used as justification for increased action, uh, for people's rights to be taken away, um, for people to be held. You know, these are all uh, stories that you know, but seeing the connection is just so important. Um, so the first thing is, is, you know, of course, the consequences related to marijuana possession. Right? Both of you senators are on uh, the marijuana possession ceiling bill that Assemblymember Crystal Peter Stokes and Senator Jamal Bailey carry. So I thank you for your support on that issue. But I do think that as we get past the raise the age issue, that we've kind of, you know, gotten away from noticing that this is still a problem, like that people are still being arrested for this low level offense as eight states across the country have legalized, as 29 states have created medical programs. Still, in New York City, they are stopping and locking us up for this very same thing. Um, and then the second part uh, is, is back to how it's an intervention for policing. Uh, in many cases where we see you know, police killings, uh, think Sandra Bland, think Romali Graham, uh, marijuana is what's provided as a justification for that action and uh, used uh, by law enforcement to say that, hey, it was okay, this was a drug, this was a drug user, this was a drug dealer. This is, you know, this is how we justify or how law enforcement justifies that type of interaction. And so, you know, it's just recognizing that there's a, a strong connection between um, not just ending like the tactics of policing, um, but also on the front end of ending the legislation that gives them that power, right? And that also deals with our own stigma as we deal with drugs. So um, just to wrap, I mean, not letting the mayor say that this problem is solved because it's not. Um, the work that you all have done in support of the ceiling bill is very important, but also to the groups in the room and starting to see, you know, some of those other connections of other policies. Um, that impact our communities and, and really the need to step up on issues that may be a little outside the wheelhouse, but that connect uh, to the work that you all do, uh, working on police reform, um, working on ending broken windows. So I just, I just want to commend you because I, I always see you up in Albany and uh, walking around the halls. And uh, when, we, when we sat down with, with the uh, Raise the Age, uh, the ceiling aspect of 10 years, the look back period is just too long. And you do five years in jail, you come out and you still can't get a job for 10 years. And it makes no sense. So, so part of the negotiation with the, with the uh, Raise the Age was to have a task force to look at the harm of not sealing records at an earlier point in time. So I would commend or recommend anybody in this room, once we be part of the discussion, be part of that task force and show how, how harmful it is uh, for that look back period. You know, a person that has a your record open for 10 years, to me, makes, it makes no sense. So every time, good behavior, your record should be sealed. So we have two more people on stack and then Please limit your comments or make them brief, and then we're going to ask some questions from the citizens, and then we got some words, and then we wrap. Uh, no, so I wanted to agree that point about those broken windows. Broken windows, like, uh, because of a balance point, it was being just talked about as a theory, right? It, was just, it began as a theory, and somewhere along the lines, we created a politics around it, because we already have read it. But it's a theory, and some of the conversations we're having with the founders determined that. Kelly and James Wilson, they were the guys who were theorizing it, right? And in it, I remember reading James Wilson back in the 70s, who wrote a book where he talked about like the disorder, right? Like who these people are. And in it, he talked about like marijuana use. Yeah. Like specifically, he talked about interracial couples, right? This was a disorder. Uh, women with shirt, uh, skirts that were too long. Uh, Negroes wearing, uh, wearing conch, with, with conch in their hair. Uh, these were the words of the people who generated the theory that then became public policy not only in the biggest city in America, but throughout the country and in some places in Latin America and in Europe. This is the ideas that came from. So when Professor Natali says it's inextricable, like the, the, the conservative roots are there. For anyone who wants to pick up a book or Google it and find it right there, um, it's very important. So when, when we have politicians who say it's being applied the wrong way, it would be like saying Hitler's ideas were being applied the wrong way, right? He just did it the wrong way, but the ideas were sound. Like the ideas were never sound. The ideas were always based in race and class. And so that's like really important. When we talk about marijuana users, when they, if they want to talk about, you know, um, you know, reefer madness and stuff. I mean, we're in 2017, the mayor's still defending marijuana arrests. Um, this is the background, this is why, because we're, it's, it's based in something that was inherently wrong from the very beginning. And we're picking up the pieces now and trying to kind of like, you know, like take care of this issue that's been festering. And it won't be one round of reforms, it won't even be like two rounds of reforms or laws and stuff like that. This is 20 years in the making. The police department has perfected how they do it. They won't let it go. But it's important we like we bring this to bring this up. Like these roots are there. Uh, and to the senator's point about you know pushing communities out. I mean I think it's also important for the people in the room to also just realize like 
this stuff was being pushed in Times Square in the 90s at a time where they wanted to change Times Square. They wanted to cleanse and disnify Times Square. So when you have politicians who are talking about parts of the city that they want to turn into the new Times Square, or we want to revitalize neighborhoods, which is obviously sometimes code for gentrification, which is another conversation we're having in. Broken Windows was that for Times Square. When they came in and they pushed the hustlers out or the so-called hustlers out and they wanted to go after the squeegee men, it was all about creating a city that was more desirable for the new residents, right? Yeah. We cleaned up Brownsville, right? So we're going to rezone it now because we want Brownsville or East New York or my neighborhood, Spanish Harlem, to be desirable again so we can have luxury condos in there because it's safe. It's not the old New York, it's the new New York. It's the disnified New York and that's part, inextricable from broken windows. Gentrification is inextricable from that because the city, unfortunately, our political establishment oftentimes doesn't govern for the people who are here, for those people that they want to be here or that the you know business interests, business improvement districts in some cases, they want to see in this neighborhood. The real estate developers want to see in this neighborhood. So when we talk about broken windows, we're talking about marijuana, we also have to talk about like who this city belongs to, right? Are we creating a city for the people here for the vent, long-time vendors, the immigrants, or are we creating a city to clean up so that we can have rezonings and luxury condos and see a New York that really is not the New York that many of us grew up in? Okay, great uh, I think he summed it up perfectly. Okay, so then take just, a just on the marijuana thing, I mean, we need to go back to the conversation about full legalization. And your colleague, Liz Kruger, has had an excellent bill along those lines that I urge you to support, but what has to be included in that is that some significant part of the revenue that's generated needs to go back into the communities that have suffered the most from the drug war. Because the reality is, is that people are being penalized for their participation in a black market because they don't have access to the legitimate market. And if all we do is legalize marijuana and set up a bunch of corporate run marijuana stores, those young men are still not going to have any economic opportunities in the legitimate market. So then there's the risk they'll turn to other illegitimate activities, whether it's identity theft or pickpocket, whatever. So we've got to have the legalization tied to reinvestment. And I think we could use a language about reparations, frankly, in relation to that. Just real quick, is that uh, <coughs> the uh, EPA, Local New York, some other groups are part of a coalition, uh, Start Smart New York. Okay, so we wanted to ask the senators uh, just how you will implement policy and practice from what's been recommended from all of the organizations. And I just wanted to add a comment, just going back to Alex's point, that I don't, I, I don't, I do not think that the solution for like disarming police. Um, and making and taking them out of their suits and putting them into regular collar shirts and being in the community is the solution. I think hiring more teachers instead of and reducing school safety officers, putting in different resources and investing into communities versus having police officers provide resources is the, is a solution. Um, so I want to get us out of the kind of idea that an idea of a a, an officer somewhere is actually uh, without or being disarmed is a solution. I think it's about real community investment, reparations, as you said, but real community change, economically, emotionally, all of those things. So, Senators? So, I just, you know, I grew up in D.C. at a time when Marion Berry was mayor. You can say whatever you can say about what Marion Barry, but when he became mayor, he appointed a lot of African Americans to positions of power. And we live in a city that is more than 50% made up of black and brown people, and you walk the halls, and you don't see anybody that looks like us making policy decisions. 
And to me, that's absurd because you always, you know, people in New York love to say how progressive they are, how smart they are, how they are above the fray, you know, like they can think for us. And to me, it's important that, because most of the agenda in the city is not set up by us. And it's an agenda about us, supposedly. You know, people that wanna save us, they wanna do what's good for us. And I think that until we start having positions of power in the city, we're not gonna make a lot of those decisions. I remember the Reverend um, Al Sharpton said that he, when he was flying into LaGuardia Airport, he could not look at a building in the city of New York that was black owned or Latino owned or any like, you know. And he's like, you can't do that in Chicago. You, you are able to do that in Miami and you are able to do that in DC. And you probably think about why is this woman talking about economic power? When you go and meet with the mayor, there's nobody, there's like probably a few of us that look like us making decisions about our communities, about our neighborhood, you know? So when people make these uh, decisions about broken windows and who to arrest and why put more money into the police department and why put more money, like, you know, this idea that we need to build um, uh, luxury buildings inside of the project because what people in the project need to see is people that are doing well so they can get inspired, you know, because obviously that's the problem, that people, and that poor people, we don't have enough peop uh, people to inspire us. So until we, people of like the Latinos, African-Americans, South Asians, Asians, into people of color start having positions of power in the city, things are not gonna change that much because everybody else gets to decide what's the agenda for us and not us. You know, like when, the, you know, Melissa, Margaret Marino, very progressive, but when she's advocating to hire a thousand more police officers, I'm sure that's definitely not what you and I would think is appropriate use of money. What you and I would probably would say, oh, why don't we hire a thousand social workers so we can put in schools all throughout the city? You know that in schools throughout the city, you have more officers, um, security officers, than you have social workers. I mean, like, you know, why do we need more police officers? I always said to, you know, like we invest all this money once people get arrested and once people are in jail. Why don't we invest all that money while people are out, right? Like why put all these resources? One, you know, if we wanna talk about, oh, it takes $60,000 to incarcerate somebody. Shit, it takes $45,000 for you to hire a social worker and put her in, or him or her in a school and deal with the problems before they begin. So I'm an, um, you know, when, Jesse and I go to Albany, you realize, first of all, how white New York State is, because you know, like people think, oh my God, everybody's so progressive, and uh, twice I've been mistaken for one of the cleaning ladies in the LOB building, you know, because we don't look like the people that should be making power, and a lot of the people that are alleged to have our best interests in mind don't want us to make our own decisions of what we should do or not do, so. Senator. Since you are of our community, you're a woman of color that is there now mm -hmm. and can clearly make concrete steps to address ending broken windows. Mm -hmm. So we want to get a commitment from, from both of y'all, from both of the uh, state senators that we have here. What can you commit to here today? Uh, what is going to be your next steps to help end broken windows? What are you going to do at, at the state level? Well, I so, so I think we have to look at it from a holistic perspective on what's happening. Uh, one thing that we're doing uh, with the IDC is we're introducing black history into the schools from kindergarten to 12th grade. I think there's a disconnect when our kids are in school where they go to school. Like I, I, went, to, I went to, my first teacher of color, I didn't have a child, I went to college. There was nobody in school that, that looked like me, talked like me, who was educated. And a young lady came to my office and she said, you know, Senator Hamilton, is black history just Martin Luther King, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and slavery? There's so many other things that people of color have done in this country, positive things, mathematicians, scientists, you know, the Harlem Renaissance. And I think once you start engaging in our children in the schools with positive images, we can liberate their minds. And, and, and uh, Marisol was also right with the um, social workers. Um, right now we have a bill, a Mental Health 101, where every teacher in New York State has to take a mental health course. And I, I want, and I think we need more social workers than we have police officers in our schools. So we're working on that, on that also. So there's, there's things that we can do, uh, and, and also economic development. We don't have, like uh, the senator said, uh, uh, Alicante, is that if you don't own small businesses in your community, then it's not, it's not really your neighborhood. You know, because if you don't own economic development, then there's something wrong with that. 
in New York City, as far as MBEs, we're like the lowest 4%, you know, at a $16 billion, it, it makes no sense. So right now we have an opportunity in central Brooklyn to have more people to get contracts so they can hire the people look like themselves and, and make money. So if we're, we're not making money, if we don't control the businesses in our community, then that's, that's a problem as far as policy. I'm sorry, go ahead. Question. Mm -hmm. no, uh, Diane Richardson, Sable Women has a bill mm -hmm. um, to steal the record. And um, this answer in the Senate, and we are talking about how to introduce the bill. Also, solitary confinement. Um, it's never happened. You know, it is horrible. I, met, I have a meeting coming up with the New York State Correctional Association. Um, I am the chair of labor, they are union members, and they have work-related issues, and I'm trying to see if we can get a letter of support from them on how we can, you know, because at the end of the day, they are workers, on how if we can get a letter from them uh, buying into the program, because we have a lot of both Democrats and Republicans that don't want to do any more criminal justice reform at the state level. They feel that what was done with Race the Age was enough for this year, that there's nothing else we can do. And people don't realize that the number one institution for people with mental illness, the number one place for people with severe mental illness, then all the others combined in New York State is Rikers Island. Mm -hmm. So you can't put a person with a mental illness in Rikers Island, don't give them the medical treatment that they need, or you just put them in solitary confinement, you know, you deny them services. And so when they come out, they're mentally imbalanced, and they hurt other people. So the whole prison reform thing, I think we have to look at it, and, and thank you, uh, uh, Marisol Cotton. For, for doing that, but um, we, we're just here to say we're not on the ground. I'm not on the ground. So if you have legislation you want to introduce, yeah. then let us know. I'm not the expert in police brutality, yes. you know. So, but what I what I'm chosen to do is to make sure that we introduce legislation that can change what's happening. It's going to happen overnight, probably not. But we have to have a two tier, three tier track on how to look at certain issues. You just can't have one track going straight ahead. So let's say with. Um, and then that's also the, the fact is that, let's say for the DREAM Act, in New York City, it's a no-brainer. For the people upstate who voted for the DREAM Act, they didn't get reelected. You know, and most of the counties in upstate New York, Trump won. So we have to find some dialogue uh, and, and, and get to a middle ground on how both sides can agree to make things happen. I think we're, we're at, a, state, we're at a, a point now, for the first time, in the state senate where, you know, we can, with the IDC can, introduce legis legislation that before was never looked at. They didn't even want to touch it. But now they're saying, okay, let's see how we can work together to make this happen. So I just say, if you have legislation you want us to work on, present it to us, Dan's in the back, uh, we'll sit down and talk about it, and, and see how we can get it implemented. Great, but what are you doing now? Like, what, why do we have to do all of this work you're the person in power. Like, why do we have to? Why are we the people who have to present this legislation? Like, what are you doing right now? Well, like, wasn't that the question? The, the first thing was raise the age, which, which was you yeah, know, it has, it has been done. You know, you know, it, 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 it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, you have to negotiate meetings, talk, get senators who want on board, get them on board. So, um, raise the age. It, people have been talking about that for the last ten years, All right? So. Like I said, you know, we can only like major, major legislation takes time uh, because upstate senators might not agree with it. They, they all think about public safety, public safety. So, and not that we're not doing legislation. We do. I'm, I'm doing a mental health bill. I have a bill for Black History in the schools. I have the bill for jumping the turnstile, uh, making it a violation, and having the fine like reduced to nothing. So, you know, we do have a lot of bills in, in place. I'm just asking you what you want us to do. You know, so I have my agenda. I'm asking you, can I help you with your agenda? No, but I think the message mm -hmm. to, to you all is that whatever you're doing ain't enough. Right. Because the reality is these people are being hurt, and there are enormous racial overtones to all the policies. And I appreciate, again, it's always hard when you're in these meetings because the people who show up are the best of what we have. Mm -hmm. But we're also saying to you that ain't good enough. Well, I just want to say that Senator Alicanta has only been in office less than a year. Yeah, four months. So I don't know what you expect her to do in four months. Uh, maybe she's a miracle worker. I don't know. Uh, and you have other senators who've been there for ten years or more who are not here. You know, but like I've been in two years and I joined the IDC in four months. We got raised here. So I, you know, I think it's we have to just start looking at it from a positive outlook that we're here. We're saying we're here to help, and we're saying you know let's work this out together. We can't change the past, and I'm not going to try to change the past. But I'm just saying, how can we move forward and make things? But like our role as advocates is to push you in power to do more and to give you ammunition. So when you're talking to the colleagues, 
say, we were having a panel in May, and we got a lot of angry people saying, I'm going to end up. That's all. Oh, I, and I, I appreciate it. And we take responsibility. I'm sorry. But I think, you know, like you said, it is, it's not that enough. The only thing we did about criminal justice reform this year was raise the age. That's it. Nothing else has been done. You know, but also, people, you know, I, we get to see, for example, I've been to like 10 meetings already this morning, and people push the things they want, you know, somebody comes to me, my, my background is labor, so naturally, everything I'm gravitated is anything related to labor, because that's where I come from, that's how my brain is trained, but you know, like the last time I did any sort of criminal justice reform was when Ramali was killed. I was pregnant, and I used to work for the National Action Network, so if you come to any of us, all we're asking is you, I agree with you, sir. We haven't done enough. You know, one bill is not enough. But we also need your help because to be like he said, I'm not on the ground. This is not my kind of work. I, I, you know, you talk to me about labor and you show me something about labor, I can walk it through. But for example, somebody came to talk to me about LGBT rights in the Latino community. I'm not an expert on it, mm -hmm. but I sat down with them. They gave me a plan on what they would like to see and that's what I'm gonna move on. You know, so all we are saying is not that it's your responsibility, but I am not an expert on criminal justice reform. It's not the line of work I have done. I am here humbly saying whatever you need us to do is not enough. Tell us so we can help move it along. Uh, hi, Erin George, Just Leadership USA. Uh, we're a national organization working to uh, cut the correctional population in half by 2030. We work, um, we co-anchor the Close Rikers campaign in the city. Um, and work on state level legislation, uh, speedy trial reform, which you mentioned earlier, um, bail reform, a number of things. And I think that, you know, I want to kind of piggyback off of what Peyton was saying. We, we know the solutions. There's a pamphlet of solutions here. Um, there, you know, there are the Lippman Commission report had many numerous really good solutions. And certainly there are so we know the solutions, we share those solutions, and, and you know, legislators know those solutions. Um, a lot of times stuff gets held up because of the funding component, and we really need to think about the ancillary costs of all of the discipline and enforcement that we're doing down to you know, the focus on suspension in schools, the hearing process, um, having the then like suspension schools within school buildings. Um, that's those are all pots of money right and we've kind of all been discussing discussing that and um, there are a lot of there are a lot of funds that could be redirected to the supportive services that we're talking about the programs um, in community and that has to be done in a way that prioritizes funding of community like hyper local community based organizations that are doing this work and doing this work well um, but I think also at the state level you know it it means a lot to have you convening this group and to have your support on the issues. But what we know is that our legislation, and I kind of say this like the legislation writ large, gets held up or watered down in the Senate because oftentimes the data and the information that is that would drive upstate legislators to support criminal justice reform legislation, to support um, you know the drug policy reform legislation, that information's not available, right? It's not collected in upstate counties. It's not available. It's not disaggregated. Um, we can't get in the room with legislators because, uh, you know, upstate conservative legislators often, you know, won't, they, they won't sit down until leadership has gone, uh, until leadership has met or taken a stance and there have been internal conversations. And I think that that is a really important place um, Having sponsorship and co-sponsorship is really important, but we we need the information that can drive these other legislators to see to see their self-interest in these issues we're talking about. Because upstate looks differently, right? But if we want to move the pieces of legislation that we want to move in the way we want to move, we need we need them to we need to figure out what their self-interest is. And I know specific to speedy trial, right? Um, we we called every single DA's office, every single county jail, we, you know, um, the data is not being collected and it's not available. And so the internal conversations that you can have that can help us, and that's just one example, right? Um, you know, the, the reason that opioid overdose uh, prevention has advanced is because the data was there and white people started caring. 
right? Um, and that is a tragedy, right? That it took that to move stuff forward. Um, but we need to figure out how we can drive folks upstate to support the, the versions of the legislation that we need to pass to see actual substantive change that's community driven. Thank you. So we're at time. Um, we, yeah, we're at time. So I know that Senator Hamilton said that he would take more a more thorough conversation just after this in his office. So yeah, um, thank you everyone for being here. And we look forward to you guys putting forward our suggestions and changing. I just want to thank Ms. Dozier being a great moderator, Mr. Flores being a great moderator. And uh, that's what, with Rikers Island, right? I don't, I don't see, if, if we can't get a affordable housing now, right? Where are they gonna put the people in Rikers Island? I mean, we, we, I mean, we can have a lot longer conversation, conversation. but the, the goal is, uh, uh, the, with closure of Rikers right now, we have a capacity of over 15,000 beds across the city. We have four community-based jails. There are 10 jails on Rikers. And 80% of the people right and, and what I'm afraid of is that they keep there. they keep putting shelters in the black neighborhoods and so if they if, the, if communities like Bay Ridge and Brooklyn Heights don't want shelters I mean I would encourage you to, to, to right. I mean I, I'm happy to follow up with you I can send you materials the campaign is in no way advancing keeping where we are trying to advance a seriously, seriously reduced system where people, where broken windows, ending broken windows policing is a component of it, where temporary secure housing is an intervention of ultimate last resort and looks incredibly differently than our jails do now. Um, but also, just even logistically, it doesn't make sense to have a bunch of jails all over the city, right? Um, what's been advanced in terms of, or what's been discussed largely is reforming and re <clears throat> reforming and fixing the jails that exist in the boroughs like the barge like the barge shouldn't be online and we don't need to think of them as jails right you can have temporary secure housing that follows international models that are focused on restorative justice where people are able to move around where people are able to access services um, and so I think there's a conflation of like the you know the leak from the mayor's office a year ago, reporters who aren't doing their jobs well um, in the media. Um, but I'm happy to have a further conversation. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everybody for being here and staying to the end. Uh, we're going to be in the back with Dan, our attorney, and we're going to talk about it. But uh, about legislation you want to introduce, but you have to put it into writing and then give it to us, and then we'll go over it again. Uh, like, you know, you, you know, the, you know, you know, you know the system. Uh, and I would ask you all to, to, to uh, come up to Albany and talk to other senators. Uh, you know, you're talking to me, you're talking to the choir, but I think uh, to mobilize, come to Albany and see what actually happens. And if you want, you, you could be my guest for a day, or the senator's guest for a day. We'll take you around Albany and uh, show you how um, the system really works. Thank you so much for everybody for coming. Thank you. You, you mentioned like this is this is not enough. Tomorrow um, we are uh, we are having our awards ceremony for what we're doing in Brownsville on the campus. So we are integrating coding, cultural programs, spoken word, wellness stuff, mentorship. So 